While we were worshiping this morning, I was just reminded of where we were last week in the book of Acts with the ascension and remembering that Jesus had, had taken his rightful throne, right? He was enthroned in heaven. And while we were worshiping, my mind was just drawn to Hebrews chapter 4. Because it says that he sits at the right hand of God the Father as the high priest, and he, he bids us to come. He is understanding. He is mindful of our weaknesses. He has been tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin, and he bids us to come to find grace and mercy in our time of need. It's just what I was thinking about while we were worshiping and what a tremendous honor and privilege it is for us to gather together to sing his praise and to know that in a special, unique way, when we gather together, the Spirit moves even more powerfully because we are the living temple gathered together. Amen? Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 as we continue our walk through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at 12 through the end of the chapter. It's a very interesting passage. I've actually heard it preached a number of times, a couple different ways. Uh, and, and if I'm honest, I haven't quite agreed with how I've heard it preached. At, at one point, I've heard the continual refrain that the, uh, uh, the apostles were hiding in the upper room, very crouched in fear. Uh, and, and weave that all the way through the sermon. And I, I get that that comes from, in, in the book of John, it says that they went in the upper room, they locked the door, but, but that was before the, the resurrection or the appearances of Jesus. And so by now they've seen him uh, for 40 days at, at different times. And so I don't quite think we're supposed to look at it that way, mainly because uh, Luke gives us no indication that you're supposed to view the uh, apostles as incredibly fearful. I've also uh, heard a sermon where, where someone said the apostles were not supposed to replace Judas. They were supposed to wait, and that apostle was supposed to be Paul. So they messed the whole thing up. And I'm like, gosh, that's a really tough bad interpretation of this passage, primarily because the apostles here are going to be reading uh, the Old Testament, the Psalms, and they're going to see prophecy and fulfillment right here that they were supposed to replace Judas. So all of that to say, uh, a lot of wrestling with the text this week and uh, Really, the realization that um, what we're going to see here comes out of a, a really critical moment in time in the apostles' lives, and that they needed to hear this word because there was, there was much that, that was going on in Jerusalem and, and in, in the happenings, and this was a tremendous word of encouragement, you see, because because they had been faithful, and yet there were still lots of things that they didn't understand, okay? And, and that's going to be the message for us. There will be times in our life when we're faithful to God, and there will be trials and circumstances that we don't understand. Is there a word in that circumstance? The answer is yes, there is. All right. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you do not have one. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near uh, Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphineus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. Now these were all with one mind. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren and it was a gathering of about 120 persons uh, was there together. And Peter stood up and said, Brethren, 
the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his his share in this ministry. Now Luke adds a parenthetical statement of instruction for us to let us know what was going on in the context there. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of it and all of his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language, that field is called uh, Hakeldama, that is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, sorry, back to Peter's speech, okay? Peter standing up says, Right? These things had to happen to Judas, verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalm, and then he, he quotes Psalm 65, sorry, 69, verse 25. Let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it. And then he quotes Psalm 109, verse 8. And let another man take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Pause real quick, because I won't have time to go back to this later. You need to see the important historical qualification put upon an apostle, okay? Judas has been replaced. They need to replace with with a 12th apostle. Look at how historical. We need someone who's been there the whole time, who's an eyewitness from the very beginning all the way through the resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called uh, Barsabbas, Uh, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know all the hearts of men. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from uh, which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was added to the 11 apostles. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, God, we we are honored to gather together as your people to sing your praises, to draw near to you through, through prayer, through singing, and now through your word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, will you quicken our hearts and our minds to think well of you, to see you as you are, and to hear your word and that your spirit would apply it to our lives. Father, we deeply desire to walk out here changed. And so if you need to convict us, if you need to to expose areas of our heart and our life, Father, that you would please do so, because when you do so, you also heal and restore. And you give us the power to walk out in newness of life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. After 40 days of appearances, just outside of Jerusalem, the apostles see the ascension of King Jesus, right? The cloud rider of Daniel chapter seven as he goes on the clouds and he is enthroned in heaven. His final instructions for them, wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses, but you need to receive power that comes from on high so that you can be my witnesses. Go back and wait. And so that's exactly what they do. They go back to the upper room that they had been staying, and they begin to pray, read the scriptures, and wait. It would have been easy for Luke to skip over this account for us. 
I mean, in the flow of the book of Acts, you have Jesus promises the coming Holy Spirit. And then it would have been real easy for Luke to just jump to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And yet there is a week here of waiting because Luke wants us to understand something really important. And that is that not only are there historical details of what's taking place, but there is something swirling around Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in an uproar. Put your mind and attention to it, okay? The, the news events of Jesus' death and resurrection, they are, are like once-in-a-lifetime events there in Jerusalem. It's all the buzz. It's all everyone is talking about. You, do you remember when Jesus appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus at the end of Luke? And, and they didn't recognize him. And he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they stop in their tracks as if to say, have you been under a rock? Do you not know what everyone is talking about all through Jerusalem? You see, Jesus' death was front page news. It was all everyone was talking about. There was an earthquake that tore the veil in the temple from top to bottom. Okay? There were guards at the tomb who suddenly the, the, the body is gone. And now who do you believe? His, his disciples are popping up all over the city, hundreds of them saying he has resurrected from the dead. And others are saying they've stolen his body. All of this is, is going on. But Jesus' death is not the only dramatic story of death circulating. Did you hear about Judas? I mean, he was, he was one of, in the inner circle, one of the 12. I heard that it was Judas who led the mob to him that night. That they captured him in the garden. That it was, it was Judas who did so. And afterwards, he was so filled with remorse and regret that he, he threw the money back to the leaders who gave it to him and he went off and he hung himself in a remote field. And it was days before anybody found him. In fact, it was gruesome. It was horrific. His his body slipped through the noose and it was bloated and he fell headlong down into the field and his insides gushed out. I mean, what a horrific, gruesome way to die. And everyone knows in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses promised that cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. And now that he has fallen into that field, that land has become defiled. The landowner is fit to be tied. You can imagine. He says, what am I supposed to do with my land? It is now a curse of God. And, and, and the, the temple leaders, they knew that they had to do something, so they took that money. They bought the field, and they turned the whole thing into a graveyard. Everyone's talking about it. They, they know the spot exactly where it occurred. I mean, can you believe all of these events? Can you believe this? In just the last several weeks, the, the, this teacher that has been known for three years all throughout Israel as a healer, as a miracle worker, rode into Jerusalem and presented himself the week right before Pat presented himself as the long-awaited Messiah. But they crucified him. And now his disciples are saying, he's risen from the dead. And to top it all off, it was one of his very own who betrayed him. Do you see the, the gossip, the circle, all of these things that are swirling around? 
But you also need to understand that for the disciples, it was much more personal than the public shame of Judas betraying Jesus and dying such an awful death. It was personal for them because he was one of them. They trusted him. I mean, they spent three years together, every waking moment. He laughed with them, cried with them, suffered with them. There is no hint of betrayal from their perspective. Right? You remember the night of the, of the Passover, the, the, the Lord's Supper, and Jesus is telling them, one of you is going to betray me, and he's giving the one who has dipped his hand. No one says, well, Obviously, it's Judas. No one says that. They're all like, well, it's not me. Is it, who could it possibly be? They're completely confused. They do not understand Judas's betrayal or even Jesus's knowledge of it until in hindsight. Because he was one of them. I mean, Jesus gave him the seat of honor and washed his feet. And now the image of Judas's face that night in the garden is burned into their memory. There's also a very important theological twist. That is Jesus as the Messiah bringing about the new covenant, a restored spiritual people. He clearly had 12 disciples to mirror the 12 tribes of Israel, a picture of the restoration of Israel. And Jesus had handpicked those 12 and set them apart from the wider circles of disciples. But now there's only 11 and Jesus told them on the final night at that Lord's Supper that they would be the 12 who would judge the 12 tribes of Israel. But now we only have 11. You see, from where they sit, they have been faithful. They are waiting for the unfolding promises of God. And there are certain things that just don't make a lick of sense to them. And in the upper room, waiting, as Jesus told them, they are praying and reading, and apparently Peter is reading the book of Psalms. Let me take an important pause here. I've shared with you guys before, when we walk back through in the spring, the way that the book of Psalms unfolds prophecy. Details of Jesus' suffering in what I called a symphonic veiled poetry. The book of Psalms are not prophetic in that they say, all right, guys, his name is going to be Judas. Have you ever met anyone named Judas? No, because mothers stop naming their children Judas after such a nefarious historical figure, right? Right? So if you think back through, and, and, and have you ever thought how silly it would be if the Bible predicted events saying, all right, his name's going to be Judas, then no one would name their child Judas. It just wouldn't make a lick of sense. That, that's not the way that the Bible does most of its prophecy. Predominantly, it uses patterns and types. And in this way, David is a type. You see, he was the anointed king in waiting who is persecuted by those in power. He is hated because he loves God. And God has specifically chosen him. And all through the book of Psalms, he rises up as a righteous sufferer. He is righteous, and there are enemies who are attacking him, who are uh, against him, who wish nothing but him harm. And what you find fascinating, because this scene pops up over and over throughout the book of Psalms, that David writes, he's like, I am in the jaws of death. 
I'm surrounded by my enemies and I'm crying out to God for help. And then suddenly in those situations, you get these amazing details. Psalm 40, 41 verse 9. Listen, David says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And you're like, listen, I don't know when that happened in David's life. But this is a picture of Judas. That even on the night of the Last Supper, his friend who he ate bread with, that's why he offered him the bread. What a pattern. Or Psalm 22. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And you're like, there's no way this could have happened to David. I mean, maybe in some sort of dream or some sort of really poetic sense. But he's describing crucifixion before crucifixion ever existed. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They are dividing my clothing and cast lots for it. And you think, this is Jesus written a thousand years prior. And here in Psalm 69, verse 21, sorry, 20 and 21, he says, reproach has broken my heart and I am so sick. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And you read that? And you're like, I have no clue what the circumstance could be in David's life. But suddenly we have switched over in some sort of pattern or some sort of prophetic fulfillment. Because that's exactly what happens to Jesus when he's on the cross. They give him vinegar to drink. And so repeatedly, you catch this, that throughout the Psalms, because David is the righteous sufferer in the midst of these moments, you suddenly get this pattern that elevates in these details that point you to what happened to Jesus. So Peter, okay, back to Peter, back to uh, the upper room, back to the entire question of how could these things have happened? What happened with Judas? How could this be? Peter is up there and he is reading Psalm 69. I just quoted it for you. And he stands up in the midst of everyone, all the disciples. There are 120 there. He sees how David, the righteous sufferer, has become a pattern about Jesus. He's been taught to read the Psalms by Jesus. And so Peter stands up. He breaks the silence of prayer because they're all praying. They're reading the scripture. He breaks the quietness of prayer. And he says, brothers, it had to be this way. God predicted through David a thousand years ago, that Judas would betray him. Jesus wasn't surprised. He kept telling us that it was happening even that night, and we weren't able to put it together. You see, from our perspective, things may be confusing because he was one of us, because he shared in our ministry. But listen, God is not surprised. His purposes are not crumbling. Satan used Judas to betray Jesus, but it was all according to God's plan. And Peter stands up and quotes Psalm 69 verse 25 that says, and let his home become desolate as a description of everything that happened to Judas. And then he stands up and he quotes Psalm 109 verse 8. 
saying, and another one is to fill that spot. And church, do you see this incredible moment of encouragement in that week of waiting? That they took comfort in seeing God's word fulfilled. Where they could see it and they said, it is true. We can trust him. God is on his throne. I get it. Even if I don't get it, I get it. He gets it. Do you see that? Because it's magnificent. Because there is nothing like being in the midst of trial and circumstance, being overwhelmed by your circumstances, not being able to see straight, but to remember God is on his throne. So now let's take a step back and let's ask the question, why did Luke sandwich this narrative between the promise of the coming spirit and the spirit coming. Again, he could have just gone from one to the next and just skipped right on, but he doesn't. Besides the fact that it historically happened, what does this say to us? Remember where we were last week with the commission. Remember, Acts 1-8 is the thesis for the entire book, but we looked through it also through the lens of this is, this is God's commission for us that Jesus has left us here so that we would be witnesses, witnesses to him. And we are dependent witnesses in that we need the power of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit specifically wants to empower us and equip us to be witnesses. This is our, the calling upon our life and that you and I are called to be mobilized in that. That's where we were last week. And if you just focus on that, and you watch Jesus ascend to heaven, and you're like, he is on his throne. This is awesome. Let's go. And then the next thing, if we just jump to the very next thing, and the Spirit comes, you and I might get the wrong idea. Right? Because 3,000 are saved when the miracles of tongues and everything falls. Luke purposely grounds us by bringing up the messiness of Judas. Why? Because you see, we dream in the ideal. Right? You mean power is going to come from heaven, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to use me, and I'm going to be his witness. I have plans and purposes for my life, and we dream about what it's going to look like. Always in the ideal, never with opposition. And then when reality hits, we are surprised by opposition, and it knocks the wind out of us. You mean Satan's still working? Satan's still causing obstacles? And there they were, the disciples. They are dreaming about the ideal. We're going to be ruling on the 12 thrones, surprised by opposition from within, so close that it rattled and confused them. But not God. That's why this passage is here for us. So you remember last week when, when we are talking about you, God using you, God wants to use you and mobilize you. He has gifted you. There is plans and purposes. You are called to go out. And, and in faithfulness, you, you need to believe that and you need to not start taking steps of faith and being active, doing practical things, praying for it, and then, and then actively begin to serve and say, where does God want me? Like, you need to do something active with it, right? And you need to start going, all right, I'm going to be faithful. But don't be surprised when opposition comes. Don't be surprised when it's difficult, when there are obstacles that you didn't think would be there suddenly pop up, and you need God to open a door because one has been closed or persevere, keep pressing forward. It's always a reminder 
that God is on his throne. If Jesus was betrayed, denied, and incessantly ridiculed, why would we expect anything different for our path? In fact, the New Testament promises it won't be. Anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If anyone wants to follow after me, what does Jesus say? You must take up your cross, deny yourself daily to follow me. Why would we be surprised if our Savior's path looked one way and then obstacles come against us that we do not expect? See, we dream in the ideal. But then in the time of crisis, it feels like we get punched in the gut. And you see, there is no assurance like the assurance of remembering God is on his throne and God is in control. He is not surprised. He is not surprised. So I will get up and carry on because he is not surprised. And and he has said repeatedly through his word that even if others mean it for evil, that God will turn it and use it for my good. He will use it for my good. Last week, I told you uh, that we had some friends over for, for dinner. And it was a great time to catch up with them. Uh, the young man that I had discipled many years ago, we were remembering that When he was a student at at DBU, God put a particular calling upon his life that he was very confident of. God had called him to do something very specific. One of those defining moments in his life. This is where God wants me to go. But 10 years later, we were talking about how difficult And long and winding that path seemed to be. Right? You dream in the ideal, but then it's like, man, there have been so many times along the road when it it was like, God, what are you doing? Are we still going in this direction? I'm so tired of waiting. Are you sure? And when doors get slammed in your face and you have to make a Swerve to the right or to the left. God, is this still right? What would you say to him? As he was still waiting for some of those final steps of what he knew God had called him to. I'm talking about a godly, faithful man. Believed the word of God and lived 10 years pursuing and just going, all right, God, I believe you. I'm going to go. What would you say to him? Can I tell you what I said? I said, hey, I, I know. I've been there. We've all been there, right? We've had our shares of God closing doors in our face. They're they're unexpected, unexpected trials where where we think we're just being faithful and we're going the direction. And like, like, why did this happen? This doesn't make any sense. But listen to me, friend. When we get on the other side, We will know because we will be able to see he is faithful. He is faithful. I mean, you can look back that on on your own life. I can look back in my own life and and look at at the doors that have been slammed, at the, at the winding road, at e- even me and my calling, right? right? Lane and I selling our house and moving over to Fort Worth and becoming a pastor and, and, and the complexity of not being able to get pregnant and then different spots of ministry along the way that have had their lumps. And you look back and you say, you know what? God is faithful. 
I may not be able to explain every twist and turn, but I do remember and know he is on his throne and he is faithful. And that's what I say to you this morning and that's what the scripture passage says to us. Because they took great comfort in being able to open up God's word and realize, wait a second, even though we didn't see it coming and we were all confused a thousand years ago, God knew. He knew. It had to be this way. Let us not fret. Let us move forward because God is on his throne and he is faithful. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, we thank you for your word. We cannot believe that you use us to, to be your hands and feet and to, uh, to walk in your kingdom and through the power of your spirit, we, we have openly declared all morning, God, we need you to fill us, to give us the ability to live out this calling. But what a good word this morning, Father. A constant reminder that there will be opposition that Satan goes around like a roaring lion, wants nothing more than to cause disruption and destruction. But the truth of the matter is you are on your throne and we trust you and we believe you. When you say that you will work out all things for our good, for all those who love Jesus Christ and are called according to his purposes. We believe you. We trust you in that. So this morning, King Jesus, have your way. If there are things in our life and in our hearts right now that we need to surrender, that we need to, to lay down and repent of, please have your way. For you are the king and you are on your throne. And one day, very soon, it will all make sense. You are faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.